Well, good evening, friends. Really nice to see all of you tonight. Seen a few faces I haven't seen in a long time. You've seen mine, I haven't seen yours maybe. But we're glad you're here. I don't think it's lost on any of us that this is, it's been three years since we gathered in person for a Good Friday service. Three years. I re realized that as I took the sport coat out of the closet. That I don't know that I've worn it in a couple of years. So it is good to be here and great to have friends joining with us online as well. So we've been a long time to be here and we're glad you're with us. If you happen to be a guest, if you're not a regular part of the Grace Chapel community, we'd love to meet you afterwards, so please stop and say hi along the way. Well, for nearly seven weeks now, we have been following Jesus, our change maker, through the final week of his earthly life. And tonight, we come to the final days of that week. Maundy Thursday, into Good Friday, and Silent Saturday. So we're going to allow the scripture and music, some words of reflection from Pastor Adam, time around the communion table led by Pastor Rachel, to just guide us through the events of the evening as we are reminded of the ways that Jesus entered into our suffering in order that he might be a high priest who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but also so that he could earn the right to conquer it all. So we'll join on that journey, we'll work our way through, and the evening will finish as, as the week ended for those first Jesus followers. It ended in darkness and silence and unresolved. Let's pray. Lord, we are indeed grateful to be together tonight, grateful for your faithfulness to us over these past years, I'm grateful for the faithfulness of this congregation to you and to this community. We are glad to be here tonight, whether in person or virtually, we are glad to have set aside this evening in the midst of a very important week and an important season to reflect on the events of that, of those final days that you walk this earth and the preparation it is for a celebration yet to come. So we ask that by your grace, you would allow us to set aside all the distractions of this time of year and allow us to be present to you and to each other in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul.
Readings from the book of Luke. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Let's remain seated as we sing together, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. 
On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. The man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. Let's stand together as we sing above all. Above all.
from Luke 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. A reading from the book of Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth.
Good evening, everyone. So here's my question to open with tonight. What's the most amazing thing you've ever seen? If you can think about that question for a second. I remember when I was a kid hearing my parents talk about the moon landing. Does anybody remember that? Anybody here? I want to see who remembers. I, I'm putting up my hand, but I don't. It's an example for you. But I remember them telling me stories about what it was like to see Neil Anderson take that first small step. And as a kid, I remember going out at night, and I remember looking at the night sky and just trying to picture what it would have been like to look up at the moon knowing someone was on it. That blew my mind. That was an idea that captivated me as a kid. In fact, it captivated me so much that for years, when somebody asked me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be an astronaut. I said, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to go to the moon. I'm going to go to Mars. I don't know what it was, but I was just enraptured by this idea until I realized that it needed a whole lot of math. <laughs> and I found out two things as I grew up. Number one, I wasn't that great at math. And number two, I just wasn't passionate about it. And that whole trajectory changed for me. But just recently, a, a few weeks ago, I got a chance to try out a tour of the International Space Station in a VR headset. I don't know if you've gotten to try one of these, but a headset you put on, you can look all around you. And it put me on the International Space Station, and you feel like you're there, you're looking around. And at one point, it actually put me on the outside of the station, and you're looking, and then you turn around, and you look below you, and there's the Earth. And it's rotating below you slowly, in beautiful, majestic blues and whites and greens and browns. And I just I looked at this thing, and the best way I can describe it is it was like a spiritual experience. I just thought that, you know, I'm so small, look at this. And, and I, I found myself there thinking, I would love to see this in real life. Do I have anybody else that would love to go to space? Where are my people like my wife who said never, ever, ever, <laughs> even if you paid me? Okay, so we're, we're kind of split on this. I would love if there's a chance someday for me to go up and see this. I think that would be the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life. So I wonder, what for you? When you hear that word, what's the thing that pops up for you? And I'm thinking about this in large part because I've been thinking a lot about those who watched Jesus die. And I think what happened there might have been the most amazing thing they'd ever seen. Now, the particular type of death that Jesus suffered was not all of that incredible for them. Uh, Jesus being crucified was not something that was unique. The, the Greeks and the Romans both practiced crucifixion. In fact, the Romans had, had perfected the art that the Greeks had brought to them. Uh, at one, one stage, Alexander the Great actually crucified 2,000 prisoners of war at the same time. So this was a part of the ancient world. And the Romans took that and they perfected it and they made it a part of basically their PR campaign. If they wanted to keep the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, this was one of the ways they kept it. And this was one of the ways they kept people in line, was by the fear of this. So the fact that Jesus was crucified was not all that unique, but the way that Jesus responded to the brutality was incredible. So turn to Luke chapter 23 if you have a Bible. If not, we'll put it up on the screen for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump around in the story a little bit. And we're going to focus on what I think is one key, powerful, and pivotal, pivotal moment. So let's set the stage for ourselves. At this point in the story, as Jesus is heading to the cross, he has been arrested. He has been mocked. He's been spit on. He's been slapped. He has been punched. He has been flogged, he has been publicly humiliated, and then finally sentenced to death. And this whole process, this ordeal, it has taken a toll on his body and on him. And this is what Luke says. He says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. So as you're trying to picture this scene, because I think it's important for us to picture what's going on, you need to understand that this is not the entire cross. This is just the horizontal cross beam. But Jesus is in bad shape already. You know, every indication we have from Scripture is that Jesus was a pretty strong individual. I mean, I don't mean he was a bodybuilder, like he wasn't this big buff guy that everyone was scared of, but he was a carpenter, right? He, he worked with his hands. He'd spent years walking long distances. I mean, he was a man who was hardy, and yet he has been through something very difficult. He's been beaten, he's been flogged, he is bloody, he is weak. 
And so they grab this man, Simon, and they have him carry this cross for him. Jumping to verse 32, it says, Two other men, both criminals, were, all, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. All right, interesting thing to point out. Notice that Luke says that he was crucified, but he doesn't actually say how. He doesn't give us a lot of details. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them say he was crucified. Not a single one mentions that he was nailed to the cross. We actually pull that from the book of John. In John, we have this conversation with Thomas, who all of these years later is re remembered as doubting Thomas. And this is what he says to the other disciples. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So we assume based on that comment, right, that his hands at least were nailed to the cross or at least his wrists. We don't know about his feet. They might have been tied. They might have been nailed. We're not sure. But the point of all of this is to understand that crucifixion was brutal. Absolutely brutal. There were a number of different types of crosses, different shapes of crosses. There were a number of different ways to be crucified, but they all kind of revolved around the same core concept, and that is that the victim was killed through slow, agonizing suffocation. It wasn't the cross itself, it was the suffocation that would happen. And I think in order to understand how powerful what Jesus does, we have to understand how brutal what he went through was. So let me walk you just quickly through. I'll try not to get too graphic, but we will talk about what happened to Jesus. So the condemned individual would first be flogged. Now, this seems brutal, and it was brutal, but it was actually, in, in an interesting way, it was a bit of a mercy. Because the blood loss from the flogging would actually make the death go quicker, although it would be incredibly painful. So they would flog the individual, and then they would force the person to walk to their execution site, holding on their beaten and bloody shoulders this horizontal crossbeam, this incredibly heavy thing. The whole time they're walking there, people are booing and mocking and spitting and throwing things. It's humiliating, it's painful, and it is brutal. When they get to the site of the execution, the person is stripped naked. Then they are taken laid on the cross. They are either nailed to it or they are tied to it before they're held upright. And it gets jammed heavily and hard into the ground, jolting the person on it. Again, like the flogging, if they're nailed to it, the blood loss could lead to a quicker death, but it would make it far more painful. And then at this moment, the waiting begins. And the waiting is all about waiting for that person to grow so weak that they can no longer breathe. If you picture this for a second, picture having your arms out like this, tied to something. Picture being hung up in the air, all of your weight on your shoulders, but you can't move them above your head. Picture as you get tired, how your body condenses down, how you can slowly can't breathe anymore. And then that panicky moment with your body saying you need a breath, and so you haul yourself upright, the ropes cutting into your hands on either side, the nails cutting into your skin, you haul yourself upwards for a breath, you gasp that breath, and then you fall back down. Imagine the pain of that moment. Imagine the panic in your mind as you can't breathe. Imagine the exhaustion in your body. And imagine doing that over and over and over again. You know, every one of us has had that experience, I would assume, of holding your breath to see how long you can, you, can, you can hold your breath. Have we done this? But imagine that being forced upon you over and over and over again. And in one of those moments, in one of those agonizing pulls upward for a breath, Jesus manages to get out this. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Imagine that moment, because this is the moment I want to focus on. I think this is the key moment of this entire story, because picture being one of Jesus' followers, picture watching this entire thing happen, him being taken from you, him being flogged, him being marched down the road, him being tied up on this thing. Imagine the pain, the soldiers mocking him, the religious leaders. Imagine all of this, and then what do you see Jesus do? Do you see Jesus forgive those who are in the very process 
of mocking him, torturing him, and killing him. What a powerful experience. It, it changed their lives. It changed the way they, th- they thought for the, for the rest of time. And, and I wonder, I wonder as, as they stood there and they watched him, if they thought about the way Jesus taught them to pray. This is what he taught them. He said, this then is how you, sh- you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And he says this, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I wonder as they heard that come from Jesus, if all of these teachings popped into their mind of Jesus talking about forgiveness. Because forgiveness was a core concept in Jesus' teaching. He talked about it a lot. And I think it was a core concept because for so many of us, it's hard to forgive. I don't know if you've ever had a hard time forgiving someone, but I have. I I can remember nights lying in bed in the dark, just my eyes open, my heart roiling, and just saying to God, God, what do you want me to do? Now, how does this work? What am I... Uh, how am I supposed to get rid of this pain in me? What am I supposed to do with this person? Do I just go back to them as if nothing has happened? Uh, how, uh, what do I even do with this? And so Jesus taught a lot about this. And what he did when he went to the cross is he offered us a chance to both see him in action, but he also offered us the forgiveness that we need in order to offer this to other people. He freed us on the cross from the weight of unforgiveness because if you've held on to unforgiveness for a long time in your life, you know that pressure and that weight on your shoulders. It's crushing. It's bitter. It's miserable. So Jesus went to the cross to free us from that weight. Jesus said this to his disciples earlier. He said, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. And here on the cross, we are given much, are we not? We are given Jesus' life for our own. We are given freedom. We are given grace. We are given mercy. The Apostle Paul, talking to the church in Ephesus, said this. He put it very clearly. He just said, be be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Every one of us faces pain and brokenness. Every one of us faces hurt. Every one of us walks into situations in which, you know, we are the victim. We are someone who's been hurt by someone else. And what Jesus does on the cross for us is he offers us the forgiveness we need in order to offer forgiveness to other people. But the question, I think, for us is not just how did Jesus do it, but it is how do we do it. So I'm going to give us real quick four ideas uh, from a woman named Elizabeth Elliot. If you don't know that name, Elizabeth and her husband Jim were missionaries in Ecuador in the 50s. And her husband, right after the birth of their daughter, was killed by the people they were trying to reach. And instead of going home, she spent the next two years there in Ecuador trying to still reach them. And then she spent much of the rest of her life processing and praying and thinking and teaching and writing about the topic of forgiveness. So she laid down kind of, here's the four basic thoughts that that I have on forgiveness. And they are as such. She says this, first, you need to receive grace. And it's as simple as looking at the cross, looking at Jesus, looking at your own life and recognizing that you have been given much. I've been given much by God, I've been given much by Jesus, and I have been forgiven much. It's this idea of understanding what I have been given so that I can then give that to other people. A realization that forgiven people are forgiving people. So we receive grace, and then number two, we acknowledge the wrong. This means that we're honest. We're honest with God. We're honest with other people. We're honest with ourselves. We don't have to pretend and like shove it down and put it somewhere and say it didn't happen, it didn't exist, it wasn't real, it didn't hurt me. We say, yes, it did. It hurt me. 
it was real. What happened to me was wrong. And so we bring it to God, we bring it to a trusted friend, we bring it to a trusted therapist, whatever we need to do, but we acknowledge the wrong and we walk our way through it. Third, she said we lay down our rights. And what she meant by this, I, I love this, she said forgiveness is un the unconditional laying down of the self. And what she meant is we lay down a whole number of rights that we often feel like we should have. The right to an apology, the, the pleasure in the other person's humiliation, uh, record keeping of wrong. We lay down all of those ways in which we say, I have been wronged and you owe me. It is the taking of all of our thoughts and all of our feelings and putting them under the ownership and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, none of this is easy, but it's all critical if we want to get to this fourth step. So we receive grace, we acknowledge the wrong, we lay down our rights, and then what to do for the person who has wronged us? Well, if someone asks us for forgiveness, we offer it. Now, that does not mean, and I'll talk in a second, that we have to go straight back to them in whatever relationship we have, but we at least verbalize it out loud. That also doesn't mean that it immediately changes us on the inside out, but we offer it out loud. If they don't come to us, then we have a private conversation with God and we work it through with him and we offer forgiveness there. And then we start to do something else because often just saying it out loud isn't enough. It's not enough for me usually. The second thing we have to do is we have to start praying. And we pray not just about the situation, but we pray for the person. She had a phrase. She said, we stand with Christ for them. What that does not mean is walking back into a damaged relationship if it damages you. It does not mean putting yourself in danger. It means we stand with Christ for them. So we stand with Christ asking God to offer them both the forgiveness and the grace that we have received from him already. I've had a number of situations in my life where I was not able to let go of something until I started praying for that person. And not just praying for them, you know, God help me forgive such and such, but God, would you bless them? Would you take care of them? Would you provide for them? You know, would you re repair the relationship if you will, but if not, if not on this side of eternity, I'll trust you into the next side of eternity. And what that does is it slowly you know, releases this weight and the hold on our hearts. And sometimes the longer we hold on to something, the harder that is, or the the deeper the pain, the harder that is, but it's critical because our hearts were not meant to be weighed down this way. And Jesus walked through something incredibly painful, incredibly broken, and showed us the heart of God the Father as a heart of forgiveness. After this ordeal, at the end, Jesus utters those famous words, does he not? It is finished. And I found myself wrestling with those words this week. What do you mean it is finished? Now, clearly, his mission is finished. The process of what he's gone through is finished. But I also think this weight of unforgiveness in my life is finished. I have been granted forgiveness and peace and belonging. My identity is with Jesus Christ. And that privately kind of created hell that I create in myself of pain and weight of unforgiveness is done. It is finished if I take it to the cross with Jesus. I stumbled across a quote this week that I want to close with. It's from Scottish author and Christian pastor George MacDonald, and he's talking about Judas, uh, the one who betrayed Jesus, the one who walked with him for three years and then turned him over to the hands of those who would kill him, and the one who died at his own hand in grief afterwards. And this is what he said. He said, I think when Judas fled from his hanged and fallen body, he fled to the tender help of Jesus, and he found it. I say not how. I believe Jesus loved Judas even when he was kissing him with the traitor's kiss, and I believe he was his savior still. I read this a couple weeks ago, and I, I honestly, it brought tears to my eyes. And I found myself wrestling with this because Jesus is the one who betrayed Jesus, is he not? But I think we all have to recognize that not a single one of us knows the person's heart fully next to us, do we? 
We don't know another person's heart. We don't know what was going on in Judas' mind or in his heart those last few moments. But we do know that Jesus was willing to forgive him. Right? Lord, for, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That has to apply to Judas as well. And so I find myself thinking this week a lot about Judas. You know, when I look around, I, I've got a biblical name, right? My name is Adam. I just met another Adam on Sunday. I've met a lot of Adams, and we have a lot of biblical names in our culture. We have lots of Sarahs and Matthews and Timothys and Marys. We have, we have lots of Adams and Davids. But I don't know any other Judases. <laughs> to much of our culture, right, the name Judas is synonymous with traitor. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I don't know many Judases. So as I wrestled with what Jesus did on the cross, with the way he forgave in that horrible moment, with I, when I wrestled with this quote, and when I started thinking about Judas, it started to put Judas into a different light. I found myself wondering if on the other side of eternity, if I will walk in a sea of other atoms, but might there be only one Judas? And might that name mean grace and forgiveness and love? And if so, might that name go from being traitor to being this beautiful clarion call of God's love, of his grace, of his forgiveness, and of his goodness? Because only in the power of Jesus does our name get changed from traitor to grace. Amen? Amen. So here's what we're going to do. With that thought in mind, uh, we're going to stand, and if you're, if you're willing, we're going to pray a prayer of confession together trusting that the forgiveness Jesus offered those who were in the very process of torturing and murdering him, trusting that that forgiveness offered to them is also offered to us tonight. So if you're willing and able, you can stand with me. And we're going to pray this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. All right, you can take a seat. And let me just say this. In the name and in the power of Jesus Christ, as one of a body, as one of a priesthood of royal saints, you are forgiven in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to worship together.
we gather for worship this evening, we gather with Christians around the world to remember, to celebrate, to give thanks for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And on this particular Good Friday, as we gather to worship in communities around us all around the world, our Jewish brothers and sisters are gathering to celebrate the Passover. And we remember Jesus' last Passover that he celebrated with his disciples and what he did for us at that Passover. And so in just a few moments, we will have the opportunity to come to the communion table. But because it's been a while since we have done this, and it'll be a little bit different tonight, I just want to explain how we will come up to the table. So we have both our traditional pre-COVID elements of crackers and juice, as well as the pre-filled communion cups. And we will have five stations down here and three up above in the balcony. If you're watching with us at home, I hope you have some juice and crackers that you can use to join us. So when it comes time to receive communion, when the um, music begins, if you're in the center sections here, if you'll come all the way down, there'll be a communion station right here. If you're in one of the next two sections, if you'll come to, there'll be a, a communion station right in the break of this, uh, between the seats. And if you're in the far sections, if you'll come all the way down to the front. And there's three stations at the, um, uh, up in the balcony. If you need a gluten-free host, if you didn't pick one up on your way in, just put up a hand and one of our communion ministers will bring that to you. John tells us, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. And as we heard in our readings from Luke, Jesus told his disciples, I have eagerly desired to celebrate this Passover with you before I suffer. And I found myself reflecting, why did Jesus eagerly desire to celebrate this Passover with his friends? And I think it's because he wanted them to understand why. Jesus knew what he was about to do and why he was going to do it. And he wanted to make sure that his disciples that we understood what he was going to do and why he was going to do it and what it meant. Because it's a really hard thing to understand. Why is the death of Jesus good? Why is this a grace? And Paul puts it this way. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God in being crucified. He took to the cross with him all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our brokenness, all the things that we need to forgive others for, all the things that we need to be forgiven for ourselves. Christ, our Passover lamb and our lasting peace opened the door to God through grace that could never be shut again. And so no matter what we come tonight bringing with us, no matter what shame, no matter what guilt, no matter what hurt, we can trust that Christ in his cross has already earned our forgiveness. 
And that's the gift that we celebrate. Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread and broke it and gave thanks and offered it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and blessed it and said, take and drink, all of you. This is my blood, a new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, we give you our thanks for this amazing thing that you have done, forgiving all of our sins through Christ's death on the cross. We give you thanks, Lord, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, restoring us to reconciliation with you. Lord, would you open our hearts tonight to receive more fully the grace that you want to offer us through Jesus Christ. Would you open our hearts as we receive these humble gifts of juice and bread? Would you open our hearts to realize what they mean? That we are reconciled with you, that we are restored to right relationship with you, that we can take the love and forgiveness that we have from you and offer it to all the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in just a moment, the music will start playing. You can come forward, and the communion ministers will offer you the elements of communion. You can take them back to your seats and receive them and continue to pray there.
Let's stand together as we sing how deep the Father's love for us. We're going to end tonight a little bit differently. We're going to sing one more song, but as we get into the fourth verse, the lights are going to dim, the song is going to end, and the lights are going to drop out. I would encourage you to not try to walk out during that moment. <laughs> that might be in a bit of an adventure, but I would encourage you to sit in that moment, in that darkness, and try to picture what it would have been like to be one of Jesus' followers. Thinking through that evening what they had seen. Wondering what the future would hold. Feeling, you know, that sense of spiritual and physical darkness. And yet reflecting backwards on the words of Christ even on the cross and wondering what did that mean? Why did he do that? What does that mean for my own life? So find yourself in that moment and find yourself in a moment where you can bask in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ even in the midst of darkness. Let's continue to worship.
going to exit in silence and save our greetings for the lobby. Thank you for coming tonight.